Welcome to the show, Dr. Craig Challen. Good morning, Craig. Welcome to the show. Hey. Welcome to Become Your Own Superhero. Thanks, Sylvan. Great to be with you. Dr. Craig, you are a fascinating... Uh, uh, I'll just stop you there. Let's just cut out the Dr. Craig and just go with <laughs> Craig, shall we? <laughs> I'll call you whatever you want, as long as you don't be called late for, for breakfast. Yeah. And it is pretty early where you are. You're over in WA at the moment. Uh, yeah, 0700 here, but that's okay. My most productive time of the day. Very good, very good. I thought I'd start out with an interesting tidbit. I looked up and what an anagram of Craig Challen was, and there was one word that came back, an archaeology, which means in a lawless and rebellious manner. And I wondered if that had, had any link to Craig Challen, the man. Uh, well, I don't know if, uh, if it really does, but the image certainly appeals. <laughs> I reckon that's great. I never knew that. So uh, we, we were just saying in the, um, beforehand that uh, there's, there's something that everybody can teach you and you're right off the bat, but quick off the mark there. I know something already. Well, I'm sure you're not too interested, but I did mine just as a matter of course. And mine came back with uncalibrated, which probably describes most of my life up until a few years ago when I started getting all of my, my <laughs> demons. <laughs> well, that's maybe less so the image that you're really looking for then. Craig, I was uh, in my research uh, from the, for this interview, uh, like I must say, like I've interviewed quite a few people now and, and I was really touched and really, really excited for this particular interview because uh, what we're going to get into is something that I think everyone heard went down in 2018, but um, just because of, you know, all the media and everything going on, people didn't really get a good feel of exactly what went, went on. And I just wondered if you might be able to start by sharing that particular story to give the listeners an idea of who Craig Challen is. Sure. So I find, found myself in July, 2018 at the center of this most extraordinary experience of the uh, Thai cave rescue of the wild boars soccer team from Tam Luang Cave in northern Thailand and that as you said it really captured the the world's attention although we didn't know it at the time when we were involved in the rescue we were um, locked up on the on the site um you know pretty much well not, not isolated but didn't really have much outside contact at the time because we had our heads down and butts up just doing the job and uh when we um uh finished that rescue it was uh, i mean i can't emphasize enough that nobody you know at least all ourselves thought that this was possible to to get these boys out of the cave um cave diving rescues are a really rare thing anyway uh this was only the third one in history as far as i can find out from my um, research but the first two were nowhere near the scale of this they were uh, adult victims there are only a few of them um and quite close to the entrance, a few hundred metres from the entrance, only been in the cave a short time. Um, in this situation, we had 13 uh, people trapped, um, of which 12 were kids. They ranged between 11 and 16, and their 25-year-old coach. They had been in the trapped in the cave by floodwaters for nine days before they were even found. And by the time we got them out, uh, on the last day of the rescue, that was 17 days after they'd been uh, trapped. They had not had anything to eat during that first nine days. So they were a little bit the worse for wear, but still in surprisingly good condition. I mean, these kids were pretty tough, I reckon. They, they looked pretty good to me. Um, none of them really spoke English. One of the kids had a little bit of English, but you wouldn't call it conversational. It was just enough to, you know, have the most uh, basic communications. And they were two kilometres inside the cave through largely submerged passage. Um, and there was no chance of that flood water going away. Uh, it was going to be there for months and months until the wet season finished. So we had to 
dive them all out. Um, and you know, when that was first suggested to me that we would undertake that, I, my immediate reaction was that's impossible. I have to find another way. It just can't be done. Uh, we were told that these kids didn't even know how to swim. Um, now that turned out to be not true and they go swimming all the time just like Australian kids but that was the information that we had and so how do you you know take people that don't even know how to swim and turn them into cave divers which normally takes years and years of, of experience uh, and get to that stage within 24 hours get them out of there um, but there was no choice. They were certainly going to die if we left them in there. So we just had to uh, knuckle down and do the job. And, you know, to this day, nobody is more surprised than me that we were successful in that. I think you're missing out some pretty vital details <laughs> because this next part that I learned about just recently, which which didn't seem to be that well publicised, because otherwise I'm sure I'm surely I would have remembered it from from the media, is that they drugged the kids and had to sedate them so they were asleep so that they could be ferried out of the cave. Can you talk us through yeah. that? Yeah, that's right. So they were anaesthetised, and you you are correct that it was kept a bit quiet at the time uh, by the Thai authorities. That wasn't really up to us. We weren't handling any of the media or anything like that. Um, but to understand that, and you know, I'm a big believer in openness and releasing all the information, keeping people informed, but you have to understand that everybody thought that this was going to fail, at least in part. I mean, you know, we were totally convinced that there would be at least some casualties out of these uh, kids. And it was pretty sensitive, the fact that we had made this decision to anaesthetise them. So it wasn't really widely um, advertised by the, the Thai authorities. But uh, the reason that we did that is because we were quite convinced that these kids would panic on the way out. Um, you know, just put yourself in their place. So, as I've said, you know, we thought they weren't even used to being in the water at all. And they were going to have all this strange scuba gear put all over them uh, and they were going to have to breathe off that, which they'd probably never even seen or heard of scuba gear before, um, and be taken out on this three hour journey uh, out through the cave uh, with their heads underwater. They couldn't see anything. The visibility in the water was about 10 centimetres. You could, you could see your hand in front of your face, but that was about all. You certainly couldn't see where you were going. Um, and it was going to be a bit of a rough old trip as well so the it's not like swimming down the middle of a pipe i mean the, the cave twists and turns it goes up and down there's all these projections and rocks sticking out and stalactites coming down from the the top of the cave um and so it was you know, none of them had any serious injuries but there were certainly a few scrapes and bruises um, when they got out and <clears throat> If we had any doubt about this, uh, our mind was made up by a story that we were told uh, when the initial search for the boys was happening, which was before we arrived on site. Um, we were still sitting in Australia at this stage and a couple of British divers, Rick Stanton and John Valanthan, were, uh, along with some other helpers, um, were conducting the search for the boys at that stage. and. They came across four of the Thai workers that were uh, had been marooned. The, the floodwaters were going up and down and in Chamber 3, which became our dive base later on, there are a whole lot of people working um, on pumps to try and pump the cave dry. And these guys were working on those pumps to uh, try and get water out of the cave. One day the, the water rose uh, just in the normal course of events and these guys had apparently been having a bit of a kip in the corner and uh, got left behind when everybody piled out and so they got trapped there for about 24 hours um, now they were only trapped uh, by about 15 or 20 
um, meters of water underwater. And so Rick and John found these guys and they decided they would just swim them out through this short sump. Um, so that dive was only gonna be, you know, let's say 15 or 20 seconds, something like that, really short. And when they brought those guys out, we were told that two out of the four of those guys were, were freaking out and panicking um, just from that extremely short dive. So if that happened, then what were the chances of these kids all um, bearing up for a three hour dive? We thought that was pretty much nil. Um, and if they panicked during the dive, you know, they would certainly, while they were thrashing around, um, uh, lose their breathing supply and kill themselves, but quite possibly take out one of the divers with them, um, which was not, you know, first rule of rescue is don't kill any of the rescuers. Um, and that was not an acceptable risk to either the boys or to the, the rescuers. Uh, so we eventually, uh, after a lot of a discussion and uh, a lot of naysayers, I, mean, I was certainly one of the doubters in the beginning and I had to be persuaded that this was actually possible um, you know you don't need to be a medical person to understand that you don't anesthetize people and then put their heads underwater uh, you know to say that's risky is a little bit of an understatement <laughs> um, so I took some convincing but you know eventually uh, myself and a few others were talked around and um, guided always by what I said before you know if we didn't get them out then they were certainly going to die in there and it was going to be a pretty slow um, you know uh, horrible death of starvation or exposure and uh, so you know we couldn't make that situation any worse um, we'll get into it well, it's, it's quite extraordinary, and I think the the uh, being able to to anaesthetise the kids and the coach is a genius idea, in my opinion, and and I think it should be really well publicised because you're right, you know, like any any thrashing about if it knocks your mask off, you are you are cooked. But I suppose I'm I'm really fascinated to know some of the more um, sort of lesser thought about details. How much air was left in the cave for where the kids were based? How long could they have survived? You're saying they would have starved to death before they would have run out of air? Yeah, so the, the air quality wasn't really that much of an issue, in our opinion. There was some publicity around at the time about declining uh, oxygen levels in the cave. Um, I don't really see any actual basis for that. Um, so I think that was some people in the media getting a little bit excited Certainly while we were in there, we didn't sense any uh, bad air at all. Um, and there was water flowing through the cave as well. So that brings in oxygen with it um, and the, the carbon dioxide that people have breathed out, that, that's pretty soluble in water. So that gets carried away as well. Uh, it's certainly not unknown in, in um, cave chambers for, for the air to go really bad um, and carbon dioxide more usually is the problem rather than lack of oxygen but uh, in this case I don't think it was an issue but then again you know this was still two weeks into it once uh, months and months had gone by it, it may well have been that was just another one of the threats. Well I mean one of the things you sort of mentioned earlier like the, the, the kids were in pretty good spirits some of the some of the stuff and some of the research that I've done for my own health over the last couple of years Craig has in, involved some extended periods of fasting and not that I've gone for 12 days but uh, once if you're able to maintain hydration and electrolytes in particular uh, you can do some really really long fasts and I know a lot of those the Thai boys were pretty slim I mean certainly they were post post cave rescue so they've probably you know lost quite a bit of weight during that time but as soon as you switch over to a you know full-blown ketogenic state they would have been pretty lucid I would have thought you know they weren't doing any you know high intensity cardio that steady steady state cardio would have been okay and explain why they were able to dig uh, some of the cave out I think they've got a few meters all be in the wrong all be in the wrong direction <laughs> Were they were they trying to get out of there? Yeah, that's right. The uh, well, that I think that was uh, really the the coach had a whole lot of activities 
organised for them. Um, uh, you can imagine the situation was pretty stressful for him. I mean, there's the only adult in there and he's, uh, he's looking after them. Um, so he was a great guy, uh, Coach Eck. I have not heard a bad word said about him in Thailand. Um, but yeah, he did. I mean, one of the things they had, they were playing checkers. They had little pebbles um, and a, a checkerboard drawn out in the, the mud. So they were, they were doing that. And one of the other activities was to try and mine their way out. Um, and they'd made a pretty handy effort as well. They'd got a few metres uh, into the, the rock. Um, it was pretty tight, so I couldn't fit in there, but these, uh, these boys could squeeze their way down to the end and they were uh, uh, digging away in there. But uh, I don't think there was really any possibility that they were going to make it two kilometres out, um, <laughs> and especially not as they were, as you say, uh, the direction they were heading was into the mountain rather than out. But it gave them something to do, and uh, it was pretty good work. Um, but yeah, you're right in what you say. It does take you a long time to starve to death. And they, I mean, they had plenty of water because they were trapped in the cave by millions and millions of litres of water. So there was no shortage of that. Um, and pretty low activity levels. Uh, so yeah, they, they certainly lost some weight, but um, they were not in an extreme case, uh, their, their situation. Um, and once they were given food, I mean, they made up for lost time. There was, there was no doubt about that. Um, teenage boys the world over have got pretty uh, remarkable capacity for eating and they did not disappoint. Well, what was the first thing that they ate? What did, what did you give them? I, I don't know. So I was not there at that time. We, were, we came in from Australia later on um, once it became clear that there was a rescue on. Um, and up until that time, everybody thought it's just a search and, and body recovery exercise. So uh, there'd been some discussion about, um, uh, about you know, the possibility of a rescue, but that was really um, hope against all the evidence at, at that stage. And, you know, until they were found, really everybody, including me, thought that it's most likely they perished in the initial flooding of the cave or, or at, at some time after that. Uh, so, you know, I was absolutely astounded when they were found. Um, and, you know, a lot of people in the world probably thought, well, that's fantastic. They've been found now and all they've got to do is get them out and it's uh, happy days. But for, for cave divers, we realised that it was not like that. And, uh, you know, this was a, um, well, the, the word unprecedented is, is a little bit uh, overused this year. Um, I'm, I'm reluctant to use it, but I think it can apply in this situation that uh, it just wasn't... Uh, uh, you know, there was no um, antecedent for for the act that we were going to carry out. But, um, I mean, the thing that struck me most about these boys, apart from their physical condition, was just their mental attitude. Uh, it, it, yeah, they, were, they were really good kids. And, um, you know, they were smiling and laughing like it was all just a big adventure. And you can't tell me that while they were stuck there in the dark for nine days with nothing to eat, that they didn't have their moments of thinking it was all over. I mean, you must have thought that. Um, you know, these were not not naive and, and some of them are nearly adults. Um, so the oldest ones were 16 years old. They knew exactly what was going on. And, and once after the first couple of days that hope was fading, I'm sure, uh, they, they would have had plenty of time to contemplate their mortality, I think, but I never saw any evidence of that. Um, yeah, they, they were just super positive. And, you know, if I could be facing up to a situation like that and I could greet it with the, the good humour and, and resilience that these kids displayed, then I would be pretty happy with myself. Well, what has this whole experience taught you about yourself that you didn't know beforehand, Craig? Um, oh, a lot of things. I mean, this has so much expanded my horizons. And, you know, I'm just an ordinary guy, really. Um, admittedly, with an unusual hobby that most people have never really heard about. Um, but we've just, you know, I've been cave diving for the last 23 years or so. And just doing my own thing really um and we had had 
an interest in cave rescue. Uh, you know, this occurred to us originally while we were doing a long, long range cave dive um, in a famous cave called Cocklebitty Cave, and uh, which goes six kilometres underground. Uh, and we're in a, an air chamber that's about four and a half k's in, um, and we're sitting around there uh, just having a bit of a break and thinking, you know, if, if we had an accident here, somebody fell and broke their leg or banged their head or something like that, the chances of rescue happening are really pretty slim. Um, and we started to think, uh, this is my buddy Richard Harris and I, um, just about, look, maybe there should be some techniques uh, and some thought given to what would it would take to rescue someone from a situation like this, because it might be us that's needing to be rescued. Uh, so uh, Harry in particular, he sort of picked up the, the baton with that um, and uh, did, did some work about what equipment and techniques could be used to extract someone from a cave. And we were thinking in terms of it would be a cave diver that found themselves in that situation anyway and had to be extracted because of injury. Um, we never thought that it would just be 13 Thai boys that had wandered into a cave and trapped by flood water and, and be this great distance inside. So we hadn't actually anticipated this, uh, this situation, but um, nevertheless, it was, you know, it was pretty adaptable and we were very lucky that we'd done some, some training and thinking and, and a bit of practice to uh, work it out. But, um, you know, as to what it's taught me, I mean, there's a whole lot of lessons you can extract from it. Uh, but I think, you know, the biggest one that I often like to say is that sometimes you just need to roll up your sleeves and start at the beginning. And you know, everybody has this image of this as some massive operation involving thousands and thousands of people, which is all true, but it was really conducted by just this motley group of, you know, middle-aged cave divers from around the world that uh, lobbed on site um, with all this homemade dive gear and uh, just had to start at the beginning and, and got the job done. And not everything has to be planned out to the nth degree. And you do your risk analysis on huge spreadsheets and, uh, you know, consider everything that, um, that could go wrong and put a probability on it, uh, especially when you're under time pressure. And that there is still a massive opportunity for just the efforts of individuals having a go. Um, we sometimes think that that is lost a bit in, in life um, these days, but uh, you know, it, it worked out in this case and um, the individual entrepreneurship and uh, uh, just having a go still counts for a lot. There's a quote that flies around the cricket club that I'm involved with Craig at Melbourne university over here. And, and it says, you can't have a crack at a bloke having a crack. Well, that's, that's totally true. Um, uh, but of course, what we must remember about that is it doesn't always work out. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this is, this is fantastic that uh, the people involved in this rescue have got such a great story to tell and it's, um, it's all got a happy ending. Uh, if it hadn't gone that way, like everybody expected, then we would have just, uh, slunk back uh, with our tails between our legs and might have had a bit of uh, reflecting to do. I mean, I'm, I'm quite happy and I was happy all along that we were making our best efforts in, you know, probably a, a nigh impossible situation. So there was no sort of moral self doubt about it or anything like that. But nevertheless, um, if you uh, end up with a whole load of bodies floating around in the cave, then that certainly um, wouldn't have been such a rosy situation. And uh, that, that's, you know, the same thing with cricket as well. Um, doesn't always uh, work out well. You only remember the good, good things in life. But uh, they're all learning experiences. And uh, so you, you do, you, you have to accept that risk happens. Um, it, it's, you know, something that disturbs me about 
the uh, the way modern society is heading is that there seems to be this pervasive attitude that there can't be any sort of inconvenience or discomfort or um, there's no room for failure. Um, and those are all really important things. You know, this word resilience gets bandied around all over the place and, and people are fond of saying, uh, you know, you've got to build resilience in yourself, but there doesn't seem to be that much discussion about what that actually means. And what that involves is doing hard stuff and stuff that makes you, you know, takes you well outside your, your comfort zone and is really difficult and has a high risk of failure. Um, and, you know, I don't think we're teaching the kids these days enough about that. We just want everything to be nice and, and lovely all the time. And um, in the short term, that, that, that's you know, very pleasant for everyone, but it has grave long-term dangers. And I think not enough is said about that. Well, I've got a hypothetical for you, Craig, and this is something that's been spawned relatively recently, given a lot of these interviews I've been doing. I, I'm very passionate about a few different things in my life, and a lot of them are nutritional guidelines and trying to stem the, the tide of chronic illness in this country. And so I'm surrounding myself with qualified people that, that are, you know, like we had Dr. James Mukey on the show as well. The amazing work he's doing around, around uh, diabetes, Professor Tim Noakes, Professor Peter Bruckner. And I'm thinking how I can contribute. Now, so one of the ideas that came to my mind is maybe I should become prime minister. And my hypothetical question for you is if I was elected prime minister and I appointed you the minister for education and you had full, you had full veto rights about impacting all the children in this country, what would be some of your first policies? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I guess I've, I've got to say that, uh, you know, another message that is, that I think is really important that often gets forgotten about is that there are no simple solutions to complex problems. And if you looked at the, the media these days, uh, yeah, everything wants to be reduced to one-liners and life is not like that. Um, and so uh, I think, you know, we could do for a start, and this isn't an action of the Prime Minister, but this is just putting the any Prime Minister, um, not in particular <laughs> our current one, uh, yeah, we could do with a bit more of appreciation of their... Um, situation that they find themselves in they've got an enormous job to do and everybody wants magical solutions to all their little problems um these situations are really complex so i, I can't give you my uh my pattern for solving all the world's problems <laughs> during the, the course of this hour or so but uh look if you wanted me to point out the thing that I think is most important. Um, it is overwhelmingly the inequality in education uh, these days. Um, you know, I think that if there is one duty that society owes to its members, it is that we give them every single individual that is born into the society or that comes from elsewhere to join our society the maximum opportunity to achieve their potential. And in this new curious situation that I find myself in, I, I spend a lot of time going around talking to schools and I have had a big opportunity to appreciate some of the disparity in the opportunities that kids get. Um, and I certainly, you know, I want to hasten to add that I do not, I, uh, begrudge at all kids that are in expensive elite uh, private schools that are getting the best education. But I am in no doubt that they are being served up an extraordinary advantage and that there are other kids out there that are um, woefully lacking in the opportunities that they are given that uh, they are in, you know, bad conditions with a lack of resources. Um, I think it's no secret that 
a lot of the time, uh, not exclusively, but um, a lot of the time the best teachers are attracted away to better paying, um, you know, more pleasant conditions where they're dealing with kids that don't have so many problems. And I have seen kids in situations, you know, there was one school that I visited last year where 55% of the kids there, um, English is a second language for them. And the, the, the situation in this school was, it was not pleasing to the eye at all. Um, there's some great people doing the best job that they can. So I, I'm certainly no, card-carrying socialist. Uh, I harbour no illusion that we can make everybody equal and, uh, you know, to, to really achieve equality of opportunity. But we need to do a lot better because we owe it to those individuals. And also that resource that's in those schools, you know, society, all it's got is the people within it. Um, you know, golden iron ore that we dig up out of the ground and put on ships to go overseas. That is not our real resource. Our resource is uh, the people that are in this society and, you know, the, the kids, they're the, the future resource. And we just can't afford to not take the best um, that we can get out of those kids. So for both the individuals and society generally, that is the thing that demands a lot of attention and it needs a lot more talk and action than it's had over the last little while. I think that's a really great answer, Craig. And I, uh, something that I think about a lot, I don't have any children yet, but I'm planning on it. Right. And I grew up in New Zealand and I grew up in a, in a home, a broken home where in the early days there was not a lot available, but it taught me, some extraordinary lessons and they only became abundantly clear later in life when I was served with some adversity and it helped me get through it. And I've drawn upon more of that as, as more and more adversity has happened in my life as it happens in everyone's life. And it's that, that ability to stay calm, which is, seems like something you're really good at and just problem solve and, and one of the things that I think is really lacking in schools right now, and I've got a sister who's a, school, a primary school teacher as well. I'm sure she'd agree. They don't teach any of the soft skills that, that we need. The, you know, learning how to do just basic day-to-day -day things. There's no education. I think, you know, I'm not a socialist at all. I'm, I'm, I'm actually quite a conservative voter, as it turns out. I'm not sure which party I'd run for, but... I think that you still need to encourage that capitalistic society because I think that's where all the innovation and a lot of great stuff comes out of. But I think if we empower all of the kids with that knowledge for them to do their own critical thinking, I think you get a much better outcome. And in addition to that, I would make bull rush compulsory for all kids from the age of about five onwards. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever played bull rush growing up, Craig. Do you remember that game? <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. We might have called it something different. What, uh, uh, Scrag? Just, no, no. Over here in uh, in Perth, we we must have. I'm, I'm sure they were all the same games. But we must have had a different uh, different name for that. It's like rugby league without a ball. <laughs> you just you got to run. There's people in the middle. You got to run past them. All right, yeah. And and yeah, they'll British tackle bulldog. You. We used to call that British. Bu yeah, very. There you yeah. go. I think we called it that yeah. as well. And, uh, you know, you get a few bloody noses and, you know, a few bumps and scrapes, but it actually, it teaches you some, some important lessons in life, I think. That's just my two cents. Uh, yes, yeah. I, I don't know if they still have that in schools. I suspect not, um, because everybody would just be beside themselves with, you know, who's going to be accountable and who's going to get sued uh, if some kid gets their tooth knocked out. Um, or some other sort of injury. But, you know, looking back, I'll, I'll let you into a, a secret, Laban. Uh, the greatest regret of my life is that I never broke my arm when I was a kid. Because you know, all my <laughs> mates at one stage during their career, they had uh, their arms or legs in a cast um, and uh, it never happened to me. And it wasn't through want of trying, but I just, I don't know, I must have, bounced or not not be in the right place at the right time as much as the other kids and uh, uh, maybe that's uh, that explains partially the, the 
path that I've taken since. I've, I've never gotten over that disappointment in my life. <laughs> Did, were you able to fulfill that, that promise later in life? Have you, have you ever broken a bone? Uh, I have, uh, I broke my thumb and I broke my jaw in a car accident and that's all I've got to report, I'm afraid. How did you go about eating when you had a broken jaw and wire for six weeks? Oh, that wasn't, uh, so I had a plate put in. Um, it, it wasn't that bad. I, you know, I mean, started off with soup and that was about it. That was for the first couple of weeks. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm not a big, uh, big eating or food person really. I mean, it's just fuel for the machine. So, uh, just you know, get something to you any way you can really. That didn't bother me so much. There was a, uh, a chap that I went to school with when I was about 16 that I think broke his jaw in a fight and his, his jaw had to be wired shut. <laughs> and he had a love of meat pies that didn't dissipate. And he was uh, very famously known for blendering <laughs> meat pies into a slurry <laughs> that he could suck through a straw, which I think is one of the funniest things I've ever heard in my life. And I think it's, I think it's about as genius as ferrying Thai soccer players out through a cave totally anesthetized yeah, um, well i'm far too lazy in the kitchen to even <laughs> go to the extent of putting a meat pie in a blender i'm afraid the um one half of the the dynamic duo richard harris uh who has been your longtime friend for 20 21 years or so how did you guys meet uh we met through cave diving uh it's um yeah, you know, cave diving is, uh, as I'm sure the many people will uh, realise, is not um, one of the most heavily supported sports, if you can call it that. Won't in be the, world. the next there's, Olympics. <laughs> uh, there's, there's probably a few thousand around the world, um, but once you you start sort of progressing through it and and doing more and more difficult stuff, uh, the the numbers thin out pretty much, and it's not long before you start uh, running into people and, and sort of getting to know everyone really. Um, so we were introduced by a, a mutual friend and uh, we, we both um, got invited on a, an expedition to explore a cave up in the Kimberleys in the north of Western Australia. Um, and we, we struck it, uh, hit it off pretty well. Both got a similar way of looking at the world um, and interested in, in similar things with cave diving. And uh, so that was in 2006 uh, that we were on that first trip together. And we've dived quite a lot since then. Um, we've, we've got a few exploration projects going on around the world. And uh, um, yeah, we have, have a great time. Um, I mean, this is not a career for us, you know, it's just, just a hobby. Uh, so we're out there to, to have fun. And so you surround yourselves with people you like and, and get along well with. If you, you you know, out camping in the bush for a couple of weeks, then uh, you want to make sure that you've got a pretty strong no dickhead policy. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I, the, the, the thing that I find really great about this whole thing, Craig, is that because uh, Richard is a, an anaesthetist by trade. That's you're right. you're yeah. a veterinary surgeon, which is why I was calling you doctor mm -hmm. before which you should never diminish because you did the hard work. And they administered ketamine to the kids, which I thought was a horse tranquilizer. Uh, it's used pretty widely in, in veterinary medicine. And uh, Harry actually does like to say that I've probably given an awful lot more ketamine in my life than he has in his career. Uh, so I knew the, the ups and downs of it. But um, yeah, we, we were very lucky that we had that professional background uh, and, um, you know, my, my experience obviously just with animals, but uh, it's, it's not that different when it comes to just sticking a needle in someone. So um, yeah, it's, uh, to our surprise, we've found ourselves in a pretty central position in this rescue. So my, my next question is if, if Richard wasn't an anaesthetist by trade, let's say he was a builder, would you have been the one to administer the, the, the drugs? Uh, well, I, um, I don't know if I would have ended up getting a Guernsey on the rescue in that case. Uh, but, you know, um, cave diving anaesthetists are a pretty rare commodity. <laughs> uh, and I think they might actually be 
outnumbered by cave diving vets around the world. <laughs> really? But, um, both of them, you could, you could certainly count the numbers on your fingers of one hand. So, uh, I don't know. It's, who knows these things? Um, I mean, you, you, know, you, you build your experiences and uh, your capability um, for whenever a test might appear in your life, but so much of it comes down to being in the right place at the right time as well. I think a lot of that comes down to if you're putting enough good out there, uh, Craig, you'll get you'll get a lot of that back, and it you just seem like one of those characters that does a lot of good, and it's no shock that something like this has sort of happened. And and uh, one of the things that I think is absolutely brilliant, and I need you to verify this because I don't know whether it's 100 percent true. Have they created Craig Challen Lego figures? Right. <laughs> No, so there were actually a couple of Lego. There was a picture going round that, that somebody sent me of um, you know, a couple of cave diving action uh, um, figures from Lego. I don't know if they're specifically uh, Craig Challen one, but uh, I'd, I'd be happy with that. Well, I think you've really made it in life if you made it a Lego, aren't you? Isn't that just the, the marker for success in life? It's uh, it's hard to to think hard to think of a greater accolade, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, I um, have been so fortunate this year, Craig. I was inspired to pen my very first book, uh, which will be released later, twenty twenty. And I had the foreword, uh, or it's being written for me by the motivational speaker Les Brown. And I thought my foreword author was pretty cool, but your book against all odds is the forward by James Cameron from Titanic and Avatar. Can you tell us about that? That, that was a bit of a score, wasn't it? Um, so uh, Harry uh, had met um, Jim Cameron a few years ago. Uh, he worked on the set of the movie Sanctum, uh, one of the, the unusual cave diving movies that are around. Um, and so he'd, uh, he'd met Jim a few times on that, that set. Um, and then after the, uh, the rescue, uh, um, he was kind enough to, uh, to catch up with us a couple of times by Skype um, and just have some discussions about where things sat in the world. And there was talk of books and movies and all of that. And uh, so he gave us a bit of advice on that. It was very generous with that. Um, and then when the book came up, uh, we thought, well, you know, what the hell, go for broke. If you don't ask, you don't get. And uh, so we'll just see if he'd like to do that. And, and he did and, and did an excellent job as well. I, uh, I'm really keen on the forward that he wrote. So you don't always get uh, a celebrity of that stature. Um, yeah, that was good fun. Well, from a uh, from a from a, a book selling point of view, what kind of added impact does it have having someone of that weight writing a forward for your book? Ah, uh, look, I couldn't really say it can only help. Um, you know, the funny thing about getting into the, the book scene, that's way outside my area of expertise. And you, uh, you just get told what you get told by the publishers. Um, but they were very pleased when uh, we did manage to produce James Cameron as a, as a forward. So, um, yeah, I think it's a, an added thing. I, I don't know. I, ca I can't really imagine myself buying a book because it says on the front cover, forward by James Cameron, uh, but there must be a few people out there because otherwise, you know, we wouldn't have forwards in books, would we? Well, I think it's all to do with credibility. I mean, it, as, a, as a, you know, you've done a lot of speaking engagements in the last year and a half, two years, however long it's been since the event happened. Uh, be what, nearly two years to the day, is it? Uh, it's just over, yeah. So it was the 8th to the 10th of July. Uh, so just over two years as, as we record this. And one thing that we didn't mention at the start is that between you and uh, Richard, you were announced the 2019 Jewel Australians of the Year. So a massive congratulations for that. Well, thank you. I, I try to take it in the spirit in which it's intended. And it's obviously 
an enormous honour and privilege to find yourselves in that situation. I did not see that one coming, but uh, I, I, I do have to admit in my quieter moments that I am a bit disturbed because I think if Harry and I are the best that Australia had to offer for 2019, then maybe this, situ this country isn't in such good shape after all. <laughs> well, I think uh, this seems to be a reoccurring theme with, with the recipients of this award. Certainly when I spoke to Dr. James, he, he was of a similar vein. But the, the great thing about it is that it's a, it's a wonderful platform and credibility, in my opinion at least, for you to get your message out there, which you know we've touched on some of it already. And I, and I think that's what this is all about. You know, like they're acknowledging... You just mucked in, you got the job done, you know, and, and there was times there before you even got into the rescue that you were told that if you muck things up, that you were likely going to be liable for jail time from the Thai authorities. Yeah, we didn't really take too much notice of that. Um, there was some talk about that and that really mainly seemed to come from the... Uh, Department of Foreign Affairs personnel that were on site and they're public servants and they're paid to be risk averse and that's their job. Um, you know, I took the attitude myself and I might be accused of being a bit naive about this, but if it had all gone wrong, I think it would have been a bit harsh to go looking to blame for the people that were there doing their best in in trying circumstances and uh, I'd, I'd just like to preserve a little bit more faith in human nature than that. Um, now, maybe I'm being a bit stupid. I don't know. We will never know about that because it had such a good ending. But uh, yeah, we just thought, look, we'll leave that to the, the support people that we've got. Um, we'll just knuckle down and, and do the job that we're here to do and one thing I've noticed, LeBan, in life is that everything always turns out okay in the end, and <laughs> so it proved. Well, I think it's a it's a really great attitude, and I um I had had an opportunity when I was twenty, Craig, to go work in in Thailand. I was ba based in Bangkok, in Sukhumvit Sam Sipet, and I was working for a moving company, a relocation company specialising in uh, ferrying expats in and out of the country back to their respective, you know. So usually the UK or America, you know, senior executives that were on, you know, some pretty big money. And uh, I was a very naive New Zealander at that point. And the, the corruption, the, the abundant corruption that was involved in that industry, including a cartel that collapsed as I arrived in the country, they used to incorporate the bribe money for, to avoid paying, um, export duty into the quote and so you would <laughs> you would send a quote uh to the customer and it would include <coughs> the the cost to avoid having to pay the duty which i find to be totally fascinating it was totally foreign coming from about the least corrupt country on the planet <laughs> to one of the most not one of the worst so you would you would think that you know given what you were doing and and if things did go south that surely there might be an opportunity to potentially at least buy your way out. But anyway, like you say, it's not something you need to worry about too much. Thank goodness. Yeah. There, there are those cultural shifts that are a bit difficult to, um, uh, to adapt to sometimes. And, you know, I'll bracket myself loosely with you being an Australian that, you know, it's uh, New, New Zealand. I always think that they're, they're like our little brothers. You know, we, we like to pick on them a bit and have a go at them. But if anybody else has a go at New Zealand, then we, we spring to the defence and we are as one. Um, and, uh, that, you know, New Zealand is, uh, we've, we've spent quite a bit of time there. We've got a, a big exploration project going on that we've been working on for about the last 10 years or so. And uh, I absolutely uh, love it over there. Um, and, the, you know, the best thing about New Zealand, you produce such good prime ministers. <laughs> We'd love to, uh, if you could send us over one of your prime ministers, we'll even take a used one, no problem at all. Um, they just do such a good job. But, uh, you know, coming, coming from Australia or New Zealand, um, you know, I, it just freaks me out even when I go to 
uh, America and I have to cope with tipping, which we are <laughs> culturally completely uh, unprepared for. So you go to some place where you have to uh, flick bribes to people and there's just endemic corruption. Um, yeah, we just can't handle that at all. Um, I had something really clever. Oh, yeah. So if I, if I am to become prime minister, I would have to renege and renounce my New Zealand citizenship, which I think of all the things that I'd have to do to become prime minister would be the most, challenge, the most challenging in my own opinion, because I am a very proud New Zealander, but I have lived here for half my life and I, I do have an Australian born father. So I don't know if that Barnaby Joyce's me, but uh, I might be okay. I don't know enough about oh, it yet. There's, there's workarounds for every situation, so uh, you, don't you worry about that. Well, you've met, you've met Scott Morrison. He uh, presented the award to you. What's his handshake like? Uh, he was, uh, yeah, that was not a bad handshake. I mean, he's a professional. He knows what he's doing. Um, and, you know, he's a marketing professional in uh, previous to his political career. So he knows how to put an impression out there. Um, yeah, I, I, I found he was, uh, it was not bad at all. Pretty personable. That's good to hear. And can you tell us about this huge movie deal that you guys have signed? Uh, well, there is nothing signed on the movie deal. Um, discussions are still ongoing. I don't know if it'll come to anything or not. Uh, that's another thing that's, that's completely without my prior experience. And I can tell you that uh, dealing with these Hollywood types is like pulling teeth, to use a, a veterinary analogy. Um, it is difficult and there seems to be no end to it. Uh, so I don't know what's going to happen. There, there were some reports around in the media that we had uh, um, signed some huge multi-million dollar deal a little while ago. I can assure you that uh, um, that is qualitatively and quantitatively wrong and uh, there's nothing going on. And if there is, it will be nowhere near those sorts of numbers, unfortunately. <laughs> That's all right. Well, uh, would there be any opportunity for you to play yourself at all, Craig? Uh, look, there's a very clear deal, Laban, that uh, I'll be proposing to people, um, which is that if we want a movie made, then we will go to those guys and get our movie made. If they want a cave rescue done, then they come to us. Uh, I think we've all got our own areas of expertise and we probably should stick to them. Um, but we do sort of hope there might be a bit of an opportunity to actually do the cave diving in the movie um, because I, although my acting skills are uh, weak to non-existent, I think my cave diving is passable and uh, I, I could do a pretty good job of looking at like myself underwater. <laughs> Who would play you in an ideal world? Again, no. Oh, that, now that's a fraught question, isn't it? Uh, I have no firm opinion myself. Um, although uh, um, Heather, my partner, she seems to think that there's some resemblance between me and George Clooney. <laughs> uh, I can't see it myself, but um, she's all for that. What if we just went really left field and got someone like Morgan Freeman just to really <laughs> mix things up a little bit? Yeah, well, maybe. He's, just, he's a little bit old now, though. Isn't he? he must be in his 80s, must not he, Morgan Freeman? I, I, um, I mean, 70. Yeah, people 70 can go, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Well, I mean, yeah. Morgan's great, so I'd be happy with that. I'm thinking more of the narration part of it. We go, uh, and Dr. Craig Challenge swum through two kilometres of shit smell <laughs> like the <laughs> Shawshank, Shawshank Redemption part. I don't know. Going off my little world here. Craig, uh, I'm very... Um, maybe you should stick to your day job as well rather than <laughs> be responsible for casting. <laughs> well, if I'm going to have a career in politics, although Ronald Reagan was an actor before he got in, became president. Mm, and, yeah, and he so, seemed to forget that once he became president as yeah, well. <laughs> and then Arnold Schwarzenegger as governor of California, I suppose. But... Um, Craig, very respectful of your time. I know you've got lots going on and, and, uh, and I don't want to take up the rest of your day. But before we wrap this up, is there anything that you'd like to leave us with before we go? Uh, look, I'm going to go, go broad brush here. And I'm going to say uh, to everyone, 
I never expected to find myself in this situation. And, you know, I thought I was just an ordinary guy living my life um, with an unusual hobby, sure, but uh, just doing my own thing and never expected to come to public prominence. Um, you know, this could happen to you. You never know when some remarkable experience or development in your life is just around the next corner. And when that happens, be it a good thing or a bad thing. Um, and, you know, as we've discussed, even the bad things can turn out to be really good things. Uh, so the time to get ready for that is right now. Um, you know, develop your skills and be the best that you can be because this test in your life, it's coming sometime. Um, you know, it's, it's, for most people, it's obviously not going to be a cave rescue, but at some stage, uh, you know, people are going to face difficulties like uh, illness in themselves or someone close to them or... Uh, um, financial problems or find themselves in a, a natural disaster or a war or something like that. You don't know. And uh, we all face it in our, you know, in a lesser or greater way. Um, and even things that seem pretty small to you and me are a very big deal to people that find themselves in the middle of it at the time. So, you know, be the best you can be, uh, just develop as many skills and experiences as you can, and you will be as, you, you need to be as best placed as you possibly can be when this thing occurs to you. It's a big Sawadee Cup. Ladies and gentlemen, Craig Challen. <laughs>